your Bible to, uh, well, let's go to Luke, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 6, starting around verse 13. And I was going to, uh, I've got Luke 24 to finish a little more of what was there. But I just uh, wanted to kind of read a couple little quick psalm scriptures and then Hebrews chapter 6, 13 on a little bit. But Psalm 31, verse 23, says, O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful. If you find yourself being faithful, the Lord will preserve you. And plentiful, uh, plentifully rewardeth the proud doer, the one who's proud of doing the word of God. And I don't think that's a negative pride. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. You know, if our heart is strong, uh, I know I shared a little bit ago about the heart, uh, about, uh, you know, how God looks on the heart, how he chooses men according to the heart, uh, and you know, how if we have a, a good, strong heart, uh, we, can, we can walk through things that might have crippled us before. And the blessing is in all this, as we talked about the, the new covenant, uh, which was to the Jews, to the Jewish people, I will give you a new heart. Why? Because they couldn't keep covenant with God. And so he gave them a new heart. So what does that tell you? There was nothing wrong with his law. It was with their hearts, right? And so we're blessed because as we come to Christ, he says he'll give us a new heart because our heart was, was black and dark and full of sin. And now we've been cleansed. So he says, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. And lots of you can say, I never thought I'd go through this or make it through this or see the other side of this. But now you're looking back on it saying, thank you, Lord. Right? Amen. Because he's brought you through, he's kept you. And your heart is stronger now than it was before. You know, it's like when, uh, I, I give you a real quick story. I went to the dentist and I didn't know exactly what they were going to do. And the next thing I know, I'm shot up with Novocaine and the girl's in there pulling the, uh, the root of a tooth out and so on. And I mean, it's like I'm, I'm squirming around in the chair. I'm not in a lot of pain, but she's like moving me around, pulling on this thing. <laughs> And you get out of there, and I said, well, Lord, I got through that. You know, I didn't expect it. And that's minor, and I know that. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 165 through 167 says this. <clears throat> In case you ever need this, great peace have they which love thy law. You love the law of the Lord? Stay in the law of the Lord, teach the law of the Lord, instruct in the law of the Lord. He says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. In case you didn't hear that part. <laughs> yeah. Nothing shall offend them. What are we looking at in society? Everybody's offended mm -hmm. by something. Words shut people down. And I mean, I understand there's things sometimes that hurt so bad and so on. We've all gone through some of that. But there's life on the other side of those too, right? So, great peace have they which love thy law. And you might as well say in there, O oh Lord. And nothing shall offend them. How many people, even in the church, are offended? They're offended at the ministry they're offended at the pastor they're offended at some of the congregation uh they're not walking with jesus now because somebody did something to me well you know when one of the neighbors throws rocks at you you don't go home and beat your parents up it's not their fault right so why would you turn against god or not have anything to do with God, or, you know, act as though, he says, if you really love the Lord, you'll have great peace if you love the law of God, and nothing shall offend them. The law of God tells us God is our avenger, right? 
He says, I will avenge, I will vindicate. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. I mean, this is a, you, we, I should have this put on my tombstone at the end. <laughs> I've hoped for your salvation and I've done your commandments. Now, you might say, did you do them perfectly? Well, that I don't know. But because of the blood of Jesus, because of his forgiveness, uh, we can be perfect in the end. I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul has kept thy testimonies. Do you have a testimony? Are you anxious to share with people what the Lord has done and the goodness of God in your life? My soul has kept thy testimonies. In other words, my mind is aware of them constantly. Uh, I just listened to somebody say that when they were younger and they got saved, they don't really remember everything, but they know from that point on they wanted to walk with the Lord. And that's a good thing because you've heard me, I think just last week, I said, I still say I don't remember why. I said, okay, yeah, I want Jesus in my life. But when I did, it was totally changed. And so was yours. My soul has kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I love telling people about what Jesus did for me. And I know the majority of you do too, and if you get the chance, you will. So in Hebrews chapter 6, you remember this was about what God had done with Abraham and so on. Uh, I guess I could go back to it. I, let, let me just read the little portion of Scripture here. and then, uh, When God had made promise to Abraham... Because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Saying, surely I will bless thee and multiply thee, or multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. This is your endurance. This is your time of patiently enduring to obtain the promise of salvation in the end although we know we're saved, and according uh, to the text, we're saved and we're being saved, and in the end, we will be saved. So he says, surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. So he could swear by no greater, and it's like any of you, uh, when you're raising your children, you're the one they look to to make the promises, right? Mm -hmm. And so... You could have somebody come over and say, hey, your father will do this or your mother will do that. Well, that's not as secure as when you say, I will make that happen or I will bring that to pass. When you're in the job situation and the head of the company comes in and says, listen, I know they've told you some things. I want you to know that I will guarantee you this is what's going to come to pass. That's far better than a foreman or a liaison or anybody else or a shop steward in the union telling you this is what you'll get. Now you've got it from the top, right? It's like when your husband tells you what you're allowed to have. I thought I'd just throw that out there. Just to see if you still believe the scripture that the man is in charge in that sense. Not that we don't work together because we do. And because he loves you like Jesus loved the church. Right? Amen. Surely I will bless thee, he says. And multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, and sometimes it seems like a real endurance, he obtained the promise. God is faithful to what he said. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. It's like the old days when they shook hands. There was no break in the agreement. Men were faithful to their word and what they said. No strife means we didn't have to quibble back and forth. You know, nowadays somebody tells you they'll give you or do or be a part of, and you have to go back and forth with them to get them there when you want them because there's a strife going on. Well, I know I said that, but... No, God's saying when there's an agreement made, there's no strife and there's a confirmation. So the confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, 
willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, who are the heirs of promise? We are, right? The immutability of his counsel. In other words, he's able to bring it about, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. He didn't just put it out there somewhere. He's made an oath to us that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Why is it impossible? Because God is not a man that he should lie. As you've heard me say so many times, and I admit, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say this. God's not afraid of anybody. We lie because we're afraid of the consequences. He's not afraid of the consequences. He controls the consequences. Amen. He yeah. keeps all things as he says and brings about what he says he'll bring about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was listening to a fellow that I've talked about a few times here in his ministry thing. Uh, he's opposed to all of us, but uh, he was talking about predestination. And you know, there are so many people that can't get a grip on predestination. There's only a few things in the Bible that Paul ever talked about being predestined. We're predestined to the adoption of sons. Uh, We're predestined to be conformed or transformed into the image of Christ. And there's one or two other ones that are not even close to ever saying that only certain people can be saved. But in reality, the fullness of what God said is predestination Because only those who come to Christ can be saved, right? Mm -hmm. Just like when we read the scriptures in Daniel and so on, or prophetic things from the days of old, like we talked about on Sunday morning in uh, uh, Genesis 3.15 there, about the uh, enmity he would put between the seed of the woman, right, and the serpent. Uh, That's predestined, right? Right? If it's prophetic, it's predestined, it's going to happen. When it talks about a man of sin being revealed, when it talks about him who will go into the temple and declare that I am God or I'm above God, this is predestined to come to pass. The end of the age is predestined by God to come to pass because he's the one that can make it come to pass. In all the rest of this, he says, you and I are predestined to make it into the kingdom if we keep what he says. But he said, whosoever will can come in, right? Mm -hmm. He said, I would that all men be saved. That's open to anybody. He would that none perish. Uh, Even in the Old Testament, he said, and to the stranger who will keep my ways. Mm -hmm. And so it was open to everybody. Now we know there was the Calvinist mindset that everything is predestined by God and people are predestined and God already says these ones are going to make it, those ones are going to make it. And that's kind of like the Jehovah Witness thing of 144,000 in the end. And that's all to get into heaven according to what they're saying. So if you're not one of those 144,000, then you're not going to be there. That's not scriptural. So that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now, we may not all be able to say this. Well, I heard when I could be forgiven of my sin, I was going to run to lay hold on that. Uh, That was my hope, I could be forgiven, or my life could be changed, that was my hope. Or, you know what, God would wipe all that away and never remember it again. That was my hope. We could all find different areas to where we looked at things where we were at that point in time and said, if this is what God will do for me, I'm going to run to it. Or if this is what God requires of me, I'm going to run to it. You know, there's a, a... some of the teaching a phrase somebody used. They said, they love God, but I got off track. And I still love God, even though I was off track. But I realized I lost the fear of God. So I'm keeping his commandments to some extent, but I don't really fear God that like, listen, 
I could turn, I could fall, I could go awry. Uh, you know, I don't have any greater benefit than anybody else or any greater esteem or position. You know, God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look at me and say, because you did this, it's okay if you do that. You understand? So he said, we have this hope before us. He said, who have fled? We can have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of our soul. We don't have to be tossed to and fro. Like he says there in James about, you know, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways about those who are tossed with winds of doctrine. We don't have to have any of that if we just are staying in Christ Jesus. We have as an anchor of our soul the hope of God, which is both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. What's within the veil? The holy of holies, the presence of God. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen? Amen. So if you feel at some point in time you fled for refuge, you fled from the things of this world, you ran to the Lord, you were chasing the Lord. Remember the song, uh, I'm running to the mercy seat, the mercy seat I think was called. I'm running, I'm running to the mercy seat. That's what it's talking about here. Uh, fled for refuge, the wings, under the wings of the Almighty, the shadow of the Almighty, you know, uh, the hiding place. You are my hiding place. Uh, the whole thing there, refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. What's the hope? Eternal life. The kingdom of God to dwell with the Lord forevermore. What is the resurrection about? Jesus preceded us, the firstborn of the dead. Remember, I, was, I didn't even talk much about this, but the thorns, you know, the crown of thorns, the purging of his hands, uh, piercing of his hands and his feet, you know, the, the whippings and the beatings and the abuse and the verbal abuse and the spitting on and mocking and slapping in the face and everything else that he endured along with just being denied as who he was and what he was teaching and what he was preaching. It's like I said to you Sunday morning and then you have a guy now who quotes scripture and a few people, they say they've been healed from him but they don't really credit God. They say, you know, he told me I'd be healed and they were healed. And they're following him in masses. The same kind of people that rejected what Jesus was about because they said he was only a man. But yet they're following a man. And the Bible tells us we're not to be looking to a man. We're to be looking now to the heavens because the clouds are going to open up. Just to be reminded of this all the time, that our hope is in the Lord. And we have hope set before us and we have hope as an anchor of our soul. So no matter what we hear and what we see, and sometimes you just got to shut things off because it's like it's a nagging at you. But you know what? It can't take away the hope we have in Christ. It can't remove what God has done for us. It can't take away the memories like we talked about. My soul has kept thy testimonies. Lord, you were here for me then. You know, you brought me through that. Somehow that passed over. Somehow I looked for them. You said I'll look for my enemies and not find them. I don't know where they went, but that's over. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. 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 So the forerunner, which is Christ, even Jesus, it says, is already entered in within the veil, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. So we can all have hope. I, I guess I will, let's not go to, uh, oh, it's still real early. Uh, let's not go to Luke yet, but let me just give you a couple things that we talked about. You might remember some of this I talked about with Lazarus being raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. 
Remember we talked about why would Jesus wait four days before he would go there. And I think I told you that in those days, uh, I don't know that they do it now, but the Jewish people, when they had somebody pass and they put him in the tomb, they waited three days to make sure they were dead because they expected resurrection. Think about that. So on the third day, they would all start to go home because they're definitely dead. They're not coming back out. On the fourth day, decay starts to set in. That's why Mary said to Jesus, by now he stinketh. But Jesus came and demonstrated, doesn't matter. I have power over death. Just like Jesus not being affected by the unclean things. He had power over the unclean things. And the Bible says he's given that power to them that believe in him, right? Yes. That they will lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. They'll cast out devils and so on. Um, so according to Judaism, a person's soul or spirit remained with her dead, his or her dead body for three days. Now, that's not proven fact, okay? Uh, but after three days, they believed it departed. Uh, in Jesus, uh, when, when he came to Lazarus that day, was proof that he absolutely was dead. And so then we look at the resurrection of Jesus himself. Three days, right? Mm -hmm. Proof that he was actually dead. What is some of those... I think it's in Islam quite a bit. They say he never died. He was like in a coma, comatose state, and they laid him in the grave. But they already knew that by the third day, you're dead. And so that's why Jesus was in the grave for three days. So uh, all of these things, when we start to look at them, it also, uh, let's see, fulfilled some of the scripture. And I used to read this quite often. In Hosea chapter 6. And it's a call to the people of God to return to him. Hosea 6, 1 through 3. It says, come, let us return unto the Lord. Now, this is them acknowledging that some of the things they've gone through was God who brought it about. Excuse me. He has torn us to pieces but he will heal us. Do you know there's one point in the scripture where God said he would allow the curse to come upon Judah because of their sins. So it says here that God is the one who has torn us, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Now, this is not the King James Version. Some of you may be reading it there. It's a little bit different. After two days, he will revive us, which is revive his people. And on the third day, he will restore us. And so many people look at this and say, this is the resurrection. Because what did Jesus do when he rose from the dead? He gave them a lively hope. The Jews... He restored the priesthood, the Jews. Uh, he brought life back to them, the Jews. Everything we talk about here. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Because where they were, they couldn't get in. Where we were, we couldn't get in. But now we can live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to not uh, acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. And so uh, it's also, they believe what it refers to on in Corinthians there when uh, Paul talked about it also, raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, you remember, as the Passover lamb, he was sacrificed for us. The same day that he went to the cross, Friday, was the same day they would get the Passover lambs ready. And so Jesus was our Passover. Uh, his 
death represents the perfect or the death of a perfect unblemished sacrifice on our behalf and then of course his resurrection was the third day the first day of the week and so we can now say we serve a risen savior there's hope for israel remember to the jew first and then to the gentile we're blessed in all of that uh, and god has done a great work all the way around through the obedience of christ through the priesthood he reestablished, as it says here uh, that we have a great high priest in christ after the order of melchizedek all right so let's go to uh, luke chapter 24 and i'll just read through this uh, verse 36 through 49 it's only 13 verses here we kind of ended here i might have read just a portion of it on sunday morning We ended with the saying in verse 34, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Um, and so it says, and they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in the breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Remember now they're with the disciples and saith unto them, peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit and he said unto them why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your heart behold my hands and my feet that it is i myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have and when he had thus spoken he showed them his hands and his feet and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered in other words, they're confused, they're happy, they're messed up in their heads about what's going on. He said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was wet yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now you remember on Sunday morning, the road to Emmaus, the two disciples he walked and talked with, he said the very same thing to them. Then opened he their understanding. Now it's the whole group that they might understand the scriptures. Listen, we need God's understanding to understand the scriptures, just like we need to be able to discern the times to know what we should do. He said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you remember, I think we read this just a week or two before this. So he rose from the dead on the third day and that repentance and remissions of sins, remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. We're not to stop preaching repentance and remission of sins. Yet some today are saying we don't need to tell people they're sinners. No, he said, preach repentance and remission of sins among all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses, or you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. And then he goes on to tell him about tarrying and waiting in Jerusalem, which will go further in a little bit later acts chapter 1 verse 1 through 3 says uh, when luke was writing the former treatise have i made o theophilus of all that jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the holy ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive 
after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Amen. So for forty days he was with them, teaching them more and more, preparing them to go out, uh, telling them about the kingdom of God. Um, and then we go further, we'll go further in the scripture. I think the 40 days comes around there in May, I think around May 18th, if I remember right, uh, about the, him ascending to the Father and everything that would go on. And all of this being the glory of God, the blessing of God in all of our lives. We have a hope. We have a resurrection. We have a place to put our trust. We have a hope to look forward to. Uh, even so, even now, if we're hoping in the Lord right now, we still have a greater hope yet to come. Amen? So we don't have to be dismayed and we don't have to be turned by anything. We continue to trust in the Lord and believe what he is going to do for us according to his scripture because he couldn't swear by anybody greater than himself. He promised it. We have consolation in that. God is good. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for listening tonight if you're out there on the Internet and pray that that would uh, stir you a little bit about the hope that we have in Jesus. And listen, there's a lot of sorrowful times in the midst of this hope. There's a lot of heart-wrenching times. A lot of times we're not sure if God's hearing us as we read in the Psalms and even Jesus there at the cross when he said, My God, my God, why, have thou for, why art thou... Why hast thou forsaken me? But God was there. And God's purpose was going to come to pass. So we may have times in our lives that we feel like God's not with us. Trust in the Lord. Hold on to that anchor of our soul, which is the hope we have in Christ Jesus. And we will see the end, which is better than the beginning. When you think about the day you came to Christ, the day you see Christ face to face, uh, you know, and we were talking about the, the form of Jesus last Sunday. Some people have written that he might have had on different clothes. And, you know, there's, there's some justifiability to that because when the women saw him at the uh, tomb, uh, they thought he was the gardener. So you remember that? So uh, there may be something to that. But another form, when you look up the words in the Greek, it actually means, like I said Sunday morning, another nature, another kind it even represented. We talked about the kind in creation uh, after its own kind and so on. So in all that, we got to realize, and then uh, I'm thinking it's in 1 John, uh, somewhere there it says about when we shall see him, it says we don't know yet what we will be, but when we see him, we will what? Be like him. What does that mean? So you talk about that form. You talk about him being in a resurrected body. Uh, and when we see him face to face, we're not going to see the picture we see on the wall of the good shepherd. We're going to see Christ as he is. As he is now, not as he was as a man on the earth. And so he says, we don't yet know what will be. And that's why I say so many times when we talk about heaven and, and what will be like and what will go on, we really don't know. We have a finite mind. God is not in the finite. He's infinite, all knowing, all, you know, powerful and so on. And so we have to just rest and trust God knows what he's doing. Amen. 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 God bless. Have a good night. And all of you here have a good night.